Keila Raymond, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. It's so exciting to have the opportunity to talk with you today. I'm, I'm thrilled uh, to be able to, to explore performance management with you. As we get things started off, I just wanted to share a little bit of information about Keila with uh, my listeners. Uh, Keila has nearly two decades of experience collaborating with organizational leaders to support, align, and further corporate goals and workforce strategies. Her areas of expertise include HR strategy, talent management, organizational leadership development, uh, pers uh, performance management. Um, Keila's expertise has been leveraged in many industries and organizations from a combat zone to a corporate boardroom. She has done and seen it all. Her greatest joy, however, is helping organizations improve human connections and business metrics. Keila has a match, uh, master's of business administration focused in HR, as well as an HR certification, the SPHR from the HR Certification Institute. She also holds certification in strategic workforce planning and leadership development and succession planning. What a great and interesting and diverse background uh, that you bring to the table. And I'm just so thrilled to have the chance to talk with you. Hey, I'm here. Excited to, to connect and chat. I think the only thing, well, I'm saying the only thing, what's missing out of the bio is, you know, the Forbes Coaches Council, which is how we are connected. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, yeah. Forbes Coaches Council has been a great opportunity, and that's how we first got connected, uh, and uh, a great group of people. It definitely is. Excellent. Um, okay, well, to start things off, I just thought... Um, I would ask a kind of a broad question in terms of performance management. You tend to consult and support um, small businesses a lot. Uh, what are some of the types of issues you're seeing with their approach to performance management? Yes, great question. So, you know, there's three major issues that I tend to see. Um, and the companies that I support, you know, range from right around that 150 mark, probably upwards to about, um, about 600. That's kind of what my clients uh, fall into. And what I'm seeing is that they know that performance management is needed, but they don't know why, right? It's kind of like, oh, it's what I've done at this other organization and it's what people do and, you know, um, it's, I have to have it in order to know how to pay out a bonus or how to pay out um, merit increases, right, depending on how they structured it and how they tied it to comp. Um, and I think that that's an issue because, of course, when you don't understand the why behind a thing, um, either you take advantage of it, uh, it's not done correctly, right, or you just, you know, do it to check the box and to say, hey, there, it's done. It is um, complete. And anybody in any organization <laughs> this day and time, I'm sure they've gone through a performance review or evaluation process, and that's exactly what it felt like. It felt like, you know, that noise you might used to hear way back in the day when there were chalkboards, right, and the nails going across it. That's how it feels for a lot of team members, employees, and the leaders themselves um, walking through the evaluation process. So that's probably the first thing that I would say is they're doing something and they don't really understand the why behind it, they're doing it, you know, they are um, moving through compliance, right, and not, you know, compassion and, and really the, the motivation to help and understand the connections of performance management to the organization's overall objectives. Yeah. Um, so that's just one. <laughs> yeah, ahead. yeah, and it's a really complex issue. There's lots of challenges for sure. Uh, I, I really like how you term it, though, in terms of the compliance-based approach versus perhaps other more people-centric development orient, orientations. Um, and in fact, you know, that's, that's what I've seen as I've worked with organizations is like so many people hate performance management um, and they hate performance reviews and they just hate everything about it. They do. And, and you're using the right word. They hate it. They detest it. It's like, oh my God, again, like really we're going to do this again? <laughs> but there's, there's some legitimate reasons why they hate it. And, and, and that's often because the way it's implemented within many organizations, particularly within small businesses, is that it's not done effectively at all. And if it's, if it's not done effectively, it's, it doesn't drive the types of outcomes. That's the whole purpose behind doing performance management. And being intentional about it, right? Performance management is just the intentionality 
behind performance and understanding where an organization is going and then where that division or that department is going and then where how the people uh forgive me i'm using some, some military vernacular but where the people fall in line with those other two elements right and so like even what you shared is a perfect you know segue into kind of that second um approach or issues with the approach to performance management all it is is a necessary evil and that's exactly how it's treated which can it, it becomes ineffective and people hate it they really really um detest it so so with that in mind so many organizations don't do it effectively so many leaders hate it or detest it so how do we break down that resistance how do we how, how, what do you do to help organizational leaders see the value in it and, and uh, transform their performance management systems to something that will actually be uh, beneficial and helpful to both employers and the organization, uh, employees and the organization? Yeah, certainly. Um, so I always enjoy pulling on the lever of motives and preferences. Um, if you... Um, you seem to be pretty geeky about OD and HR and change, and change management like me, but like Skinner and Carl Bonder is another thought leader in this area, right? Where there's six elements, right, to uh, influence behavior or and or get desired results. And motive, motives and preference seems to be the one that's really hard for any organization. I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? They hate it, they detest it, right? It's their preference, right? Uh, or there's something similar in the culture. I, I like to call it cultural undercurrent. Um, that's getting that response out of them, right? So we know it's, um, it could be an expectations and feedback issue. Um, it's probably not too much of a uh, incentive or consequence issue because the end result of most performance reviews is, is, is that carrot, is that 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, up to 6% increase. Um, so in engaging with leaders, I really try to dig into their motives and preferences and then also help them dig into their, their team members and their employees' motives and preferences, right? Reminding them behind the why of what we're doing. And then also, I love asking questions, right? Because you really get the insights into what people are thinking. But then also um, helping them to see that using, which is another issue that I see with performance management in organizations, is using this Me Too strategy right so generally it's ineffective because uh, some of my hr peers our, our od peers um, and practitioners you know go from one company to another company and what they're doing is saying this you know this is what we're this is what we did here or this is how we approached it here and while it probably was great or maybe it wasn't so great <laughs> wherever they came from you know it's not true innovation that's happening right it's just a small shift in some process that someone learned from somewhere else. Um, so I really try to dig into what are we trying to accomplish here, right? Um, because really, you don't have to have performance management. Like if you hate it that much, and it doesn't matter, like you don't have to have this formal process, right? Um, you know that larger organizations like HP has done away with the formal rating and they really kind of shifted how they approach performance uh, management. Any organization, any other leader can do the same. But again, kind of linking it back to what are our objectives? What's our vision? What's our mission? And where are we headed? And ensure that however we manage performance and however we have these consistent and timely um, performance conversations and the feedback loop, that it matches the culture, mission, and the vision. Right? And that can look so many different ways. Right? Yeah, and I, I love everything you say there. And, and you you add in the example, you know, there, there are companies that have done away with kind of the traditional formal performance management or performance appraisal systems, but that doesn't mean they've done, that they don't do performance management. That just, right. means, that just means they've transformed the old processes into something that's more real time with the feedback. Yes. And loop. agile. And agile, yeah. absolutely. Yes. And, and so- And where the feeling is not, they hate it, right? And it's more natural to the employee's experience, to the leader's experience, because I think the traditional um, thing about performance management is it's one time a year. So this is one conversation that we're gonna have about what I've done over the last 364 or 65 days, depending on the year, right? This one time we're gonna have this conversation and the leader is going to attempt to sit down and write a narrative or give a couple examples to substantiate 
some number. And the human flaw in that is, I probably only remember what you've done for me lately. <laughs> I forgot about January or I forgot about last October, depending on the fiscal year, right? So, you know, it's inherently flawed, which is also why we kind of hate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And everyone just, everyone can see through that. They can see through those flaws and the, the biases. Some, some just uh, implicit, you know, uh, biases that we're not even aware of. But the, there's so many biases that can inform those types of ratings. And so having a more agile, real-time um, type of informal process uh, can be very effective. And it's all about the feedback loops. It's all about the coaching and the mentoring. And we know that millennials and Gen Z workers want so much of that, um, that they want regular feedback. And I, sometimes I, I kind of chuckle when I, I hear, um, I, I sometimes will hear um, older uh, leaders bemoan millennials and how high maintenance they are and you know there, there may be something to that to an extent but largely millennials are basically asking for what we are teaching organizational leaders to do they they just have a, a heightened expectation that they should get regular feedback which is what leaders should do yes. uh, and so if i'm going to effectively lead people I have to coach and mentor and provide feedback on an ongoing basis. Otherwise, I'm not really leading people, right? <laughs> no, no, you're not leading people, nor are you leading the performance, right? Or you can't appropriately um, speak to the performance, right? Because that's really what happens. Um, and we can think about it in any phase um, of the employee life cycle. Think about onboarding, right? And whether that exists in some formal or informal way, but there is, um, you know, you, you give you give an employee information and training and our content, and then you say, okay, you should you have it right. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and take care of it. And then there's no feedback. You don't know how well they took it in. You don't know well. You don't know how well um, they understood it. The quality of it, the quantity, if there are any performance metrics or standards that relate that relates to that. And without being there in the moment or at least pausing to say, hey, let's take 10, 15 minutes to talk about what that felt like, to talk about what questions you may have, um, to talk about where the process worked or didn't work. Uh, because um, in my performance improvement background, that's generally where I find the beautiful nuggets of improving, improving a process is in talking to people and they'll say, well, yeah, I didn't do this. I found I don't this any, do this anymore. And I do this instead. I'm like, huh, tell me why, right? Uh, because they found a better way, right? And again, if I'm not leading and if I'm not having those in the moment conversations or that feedback um, to even say, oh, actually that's great. I think I'm gonna get the rest of the team to follow that same tip or process. Or I come in and say, eh, well, you know, while that's great and while that works for you, let me give you the method to our madness and why it's so important that you don't skip this step and you actually click this button in the system because when you click this button, it has these other impacts to our other partners and the other people that are a part of this entire process. It's a trigger. Um, so again, you know, kind of getting small examples and details of the importance of, yeah, it's really important to be there to see the performance, observe it and give that just in time, um, you know, feedback. You know, sometimes I, I do, I say this, you know, I have my lazy leaders. <laughs> You know, and at the end of the day, that may sound harsh, it may sound mean, some leaders may be like, ah, the nerve of her, but it's the truth, right? It's just you become a lazy leader and you want these human beings to become robots. And that's just not who they are. It's not who we are and it's not who we're designed to be. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and I'm all about helping develop uh, people-centric organizations with people-centric yes. cultures and processes. And so much of this compliance-based uh, uh, performance management of the past it mm -hmm. is not people-centered. It's it's process-centered, and that's why people hate it. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you were to give like one or two like key tips to anyone listening today who's running uh, an organization or, or as a leader in an organization, what would be those one or two um, things they could do immediately to improve performance management? Sure. Um, the first thing is around 
communication and understanding that performance management is truly a conversation at its most foundational and simplistic state. Um, you can do way more with um, micro conversations than you will with sitting down and taking, let's say the performance, you know, a review cycle process takes a total of, you know, three to five hours, right? When you wait until the end of that year to take care of it. Um, so that would be really, if you do nothing else and you can help leaders and um, team members and people to understand that performance management is just a simple conversation. And more often than not, it's a coaching conversation. Um, and that, you know, when you're looking to improve performance and help your people and organization, um, that your leaders don't take the lazy route out and say, I'm gonna give them training. Because there's a whole diatribe that I can go down the road around around training, using training as a solution, but training is not always the solution. And this is from a training OD professional, right? Training solves probably 5% of your problems. And that's the, that's the rabbit out of the hat that most leaders want to use and leverage instead of just leveraging coaching, right? To sit there and say, hey, let me see what you did um, in executing this step or this process and just watch. And then say, oh, I see something you can do, right? And that's managing performance, right? And just because I took those five minutes um, to curb whether it's good or to applaud, um, I'm sorry, to curb bad behavior or applaud, applaud good behavior, I'm going to get so many returns on that micro conversation, right? Or that, that, that small engagement with my team member. And that's really... You do that multiple times throughout the year, you have managed performance well. And then the only thing, the number two thing that I probably would say outside of that is taking time and space. Um, you know, let the cadence be decided by the leader and, and, the, and, and the team member. But at, I would say probably minimum monthly, I would to just talk about some wins, right? Talk about some wins that you that that employee has had over th that month or th those weeks. Um, and then, you know, one or two things that they could do better. I know per personally with my team, um, when I do their one-on-one, -on -one, they can't tell me anything else. I don't want to hear about what's happening on the client. Uh, I don't want to hear about processes. The first thing that I want to hear is tell me two to three things you've done that you just killed it. You nailed it. It went so well. You're proud of yourself. Um, since the last time we spoke, and if they give me two things, then I only want to hear one thing that didn't go so well. But we'll talk about that. I, and I coach to both, to the good things and to the bad things after I take the time to truly listen, um, you know, to what they put on the table and what they have to say. Um, and truthfully, I don't have a lot of, <laughs> you know, the bad problems that most leaders deal with or engage with because I'm having those in the moment, just in time conversations to talk through performance and it's rare that I forget um, or I can't speak to instances when I'm ready to write up their review because in my organization we do have a formal you know uh, narrative that we write up but and when I speak to this where they killed it they nailed it oh my god it was amazing it was awesome or in some reviews I have to say hey here's where I think we can um, step it up next year I have it all there's no surprise to them right that's one of the things that happens in performance reviews right they're not getting the feedback, so they're alarmed and they're surprised come that one time with you. Like, I had no idea my leader felt that way. I didn't know that that was an issue. I've been, you know, doing this all the time, every time, and it's now it's a habit that's probably going to be part of the break. Um, so, again, communication, right, and performance is simple conversations. And then making sure to have time and space set aside to just review, you know, what's been happening, and how well. Um, he or she has been performing, and of course, we always have opportunities for improvement and making space to talk about those two on a frequent basis. You know, so in essence, I'm kind of a taking the millennials approach. <laughs> yeah, you know, to perform to performance management. Yeah, no, I think those are great tips, and it doesn't have. It's not rocket science. It's um, not the number of times I say that to students and organizational leaders. Like it's not rocket science. There's some basic <laughs> principles. You can start to implement these um, consistently and it'll make a world of difference. Yes. Um, and I, I was just going to share a quick example. I have a colleague. Um, he had he, out of college. His first um, big uh, HR related role was with Goldman Sachs. 
a great, oh. great opportunity, a great organization. Um, and they, they do some pretty interesting things in terms of performance management. Uh, and it's, it's quite complex actually. Um, but they, they follow some really great sound principles and I'm not going to go into all those details, but the point was that's where he started. So his first professional experience was doing this super intense, comprehensive, year-long performance uh, per performance management type of process. And then he left Goldman after a few years and he went to another large organization and they had a different but similarly kind of formally structured process. Mm -hmm. And then after being there for several years, he went and was hired as an HR generalist leading the whole HR area at a kind of a medium-sized business. And when he got there, his first inclination was, I'm going to duplicate and replicate what they did at Goldman um, because that was a really cool um, process. And But without thinking about the culture at this new organization or the, you know, the appetite of current leadership towards mm -hmm. these types of processes. And so for the first couple of months he was there, he was like banging his head against the wall, just trying to do all these complicated things. And finally he came to the realization that, wait a minute, I just need to simplify. So he simplified it down to really just a few basic questions, regular check-in um, coaching sessions. And he's over the last couple of years he's been there, he's seen tremendous results in helping people really drive, not, not compliance-based performance management, but really performance management to drive performance, which is <laughs> what the, figure. <laughs> yeah, exactly, which is what the actual intent is. So it's yeah. not rocket science. You don't, ha you don't have to do this super complex system. You just need to have consistent conversations. And when that can happen, um, then amazing things can happen. So no, I know, and I think that's a that's a very, very good point. And it kind of speaks to you know the um the things that I see in partnering and working with my clients, right? Initially starting out, he did he leveraged, you know, like that a me too strategy. Let me take what you know I've learned, you know, from my past. Um, and we all, you know, in the HR OG world, we know that culture is king, right? You can have a phenomenal idea, a great idea, but culture will press, a, will actually eat it up and spit it out. <laughs> you know, if you're not really understanding the cultural climate, the current, and what works in this environment, right? And then where the organization is, is heading. Um, so no, I think that's a great, great, great example. And in this day and age with this technology and all the things we have access to um, and just you know even our attention span right we know that like as the years progress our attention span is shorter and shorter and shorter so no one has time or energy for you know complexity all of us want things simple right because even think about from our HR hat or our, you know our OD perspective someone has to manage this complex program <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so you do. You want it simple for the people to execute on it, and you want it simple so that it can, so that uh, we um, can manage it well, right? And we see the results that we truly want, which is driving people performance. Absolutely wonderful. Well, it has been a real pleasure talking with you this past half hour. Um, time goes too quickly, and we never have enough time to go into everything, but. Uh, hopefully I can have you back at some point and we can talk more about some of these types of issues in the future. It would be an honor. It would. Um, as we wrap up today, uh, maybe you can just share with my listeners, how can they get in touch with you and what's the best way for them to learn more about you? Absolutely. So I am always on LinkedIn. So that's a great place. Um, Keila N. Raymond, um, as well as social media. You can follow me um, on at Be The Spark, that's B-E-T-H-E, -E, and that's Spark with a C, S-P-A-R-C. Um, and those are probably the, the number two way to kind of connect with me, um, as well as, of course, you can email me anytime, any questions. I love talking about HR, OD, people-centric programs um, and helping organizations improve human connections um, and improve the business metrics as well. So that's Keila at BeTheSpark.com as well if you want to shoot me an email. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you and I hope you have a great rest of your week. You too, you too. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.